1. I've always had high work ethics, always arrive early at work, and live and die by my saying rather 10 minutes earlier than 10 seconds late. The thing is, not only do I always arrive early, I struggle with staying still for too long. So what happens when I get to work? I'm not exactly making myself a cup of coffee and sitting and watching. I jump in and start working. On the other hand, if it is very calm at work and circumstances allow it, I don't think it's a bad thing to clock out a few minutes early. And when the circumstances don't allow it, I also don't mind working a bit of overtime until the brunt of the workload eased up. With this being McDonald's, I most of the time clocked in early and clocked out late. The co-workers don't mind, the shift managers don't mind, the boss on the other hand is the type of person with a stick up his butt. One day it's been calm for roughly 20 minutes and we've done everything one usually didn't have time for in the kitchen. I have roughly 10 minutes left on my shift and ask my co-worker, Tim, if they can hold the fort until the next guy starts and I can call it a night. He laughs it off and tells me everything is a-okay. I change clothes and get ready to clock out and see my boss coming towards me. Where do you think you're going? Home? You still have time left in your shift. I know, I came in earlier to help. It's calm and we've done all the prep and clean we can. There's nothing left to do unless a customer walks in. Tim can handle the kitchen no problem and the next guy will be here in ten. If you're scheduled, you're supposed to do your hours. You can still clean something. Hugh malicious compliance. After that conversation, I made sure to always clock in right on time, and then go change and wash hands, etc., which resulted in me entering the kitchen a few minutes late every day, regardless of how many customers there were. And since the boss was explicit about sticking to my hours, I always made sure to clock out right on time. Whenever the co-workers or managers asked me to stay, I told them, Boss told me to stick to my schedule. Sorry guys, it's out of my hands. Best of luck though. Line is stretched outside the restaurant? Ain't my problem. Just got a phone call of three buses with tourists coming in. Nope. Boss asking me to help. <laughs> Sorry boss. It is outside of my scheduled hours. May I suggest you grab an apron, wash your hands, and help the guys in the kitchen. They'll get swamped otherwise. See you Monday. 2. In the UK, there is a huge nationwide electronics retail store called Curry's. They are renowned for having terrible customer service, but very occasionally having decent prices. I was in the market for a KitchenAid stand mixer, and my employer had an arrangement where I could buy Curry's gift cards for a 10% discount. I was a bit reluctant to use them on past experiences, but thought I would take advantage of saving a bit of cash and ordered my mixer online. Delivery date due in a week. Easy peasy, I thought. I was about £250, roughly $300 before the discount. Delivery day comes and goes, no mixer. The next day I ring up customer service and ask what happened. After 20 minutes on hold, they tell me the product is out of stock and I will need to wait for their next delivery in 10 days time. Not too bad, I'm a patient person. Ten days later, still no mixer or order update, even though it's showing as in stock and available to buy on their website. Back on the phone to customer service. More time on hold. This time I'm told there is an order backlog and they couldn't tell me when it would be delivered, so I ask for a refund. Unfortunately, in the UK, if you pay by gift card, you only get a refund by gift card. At this point, I had no desire to ever use curries again and was disappointed in myself for ever giving it a go. I would have no use for a gift card, so I decided to give them a bit more time. No prizes for guessing that this didn't bear fruit. A couple of weeks later, I use the customer service online chat to see what is going on. Again, they are completely unable to help or confirm when or if I would receive my order. I asked what I was expected to do, and the bloke said something along the lines of, No idea, mate. You would have to take out with our board. <laughs> Fine. It's malicious compliance time. A quick trip to the company's house website gives me a list of all their directors. 
easily findable yourself if you suffer a similar fate. Another hour on LinkedIn and I've tracked them all down. I proceed to send every director a summary of what has happened and links to screenshots of the online chat I had with the customer service rep. Less than a day later, I get a call from the CEO's personal assistant, apologizing profusely and personally guaranteeing she will sort it out. By the time this all happened, the mixer had gone down by another £60, so she processed my order again and said she would arrange for the accounts team to send me a voucher for the difference. She was genuinely the hero of this story. The very next day, my mixer arrives. Happy days. A few days after that, I get a letter with a Curry's voucher. I thought this would be the end of my sorry saga. However, as the icing on the cake that I was making because I now had the mixer, they proceeded to send me three more £60 vouchers at random intervals over the next few months. I can only guess that their admin team is as useless as a customer service team. For completedness, I spent the vouchers on a new oven, which unsurprisingly turned up late and faulty and had to be replaced. 3. So I used to work for one of the top delivery companies in the UK. There was a lot less competition 15 years ago. I was very good at my specific delivery job and often undertook every office task from single delivery routes to maintaining the office and delivery distribution to all routes. Then one day in comes a new manager, and it was the cliché that you dread. You probably have met the type. Suit slightly too big and a trainee mustache. He had just finished uni, and to his credit got himself a business degree. The problem with this country was every office around the whole country was run differently, and this poor manager was expecting every person to do things by the letter, but most of the work was done on goodwill, since we were allowed to finish for the day when we had completed our deliveries. It was creating a rod for our own backs, to be honest, and it was nice to finish earlier on lighter days. Finally, on his third day, after watching me daily and asking me why I was doing things in certain orders, I told him my delivery route was complex and required it to be done in a certain order to ensure the time deliveries got there before 1pm and the other delivery stuff were fed their delivery materials by myself at certain times to assure optimum delivery speeds and minimum delay. He replied, No, it doesn't work like that. I simply stared for a bemused few seconds and said, I don't understand. He wanted it by the letter today as per company guidelines. I argued very hard against it and said he will really regret it because we won't complete, but he insisted I was wrong because it was all timed and measured. So after an exasperated 15-minute heated discussion, I did as I was told. To the letter. The five staff I fed deliveries to weren't happy but understood. It was like a domino effect of carnage. At 12.30 p.m., we all rang in the office to report the failed time deliveries, which he promptly freaked out about, because they were strictly monitored. The subsequent enforced break times and shuffling required also left 15 to 20 percent of each walk unfinished, which he also now has to complete himself on top of the timed ones. He had to fill out reports for all failed 1 p.m. deliveries, all walk failures, and then he had to call in managers from other offices to finish it all. They all finished around four hours late. <laughs> he was not popular. The next day he came to me and asked me to show him the mechanics of the delivery route in detail. I didn't expect that to happen, if I'm honest. It was close enough to an apology for me. We actually became good friends, over time. But he never questioned me when I said nope ever again. 4. Many years ago, I worked at Kinko's, now FedEx office. I often worked graveyard shifts and had to deal with lots of people early in the morning who hadn't had their coffee yet. For some context, overnight was a time when long machine runs were printed and tedious finishing work was done. Being the only one working until 6am when the morning crew started to trickle in, I was often in the middle of something when the customer came in and it would take me a second to get to the counter to help them. One morning, around 5 a.m., I'm in the back doing some binding work. I hear the door alarm and had just put a perfect binding in the heater. 
This takes about 15 to 20 seconds to melt the glue and bind the pages. I yell from the back, I'll be right out. The bitchy customer responds, I'm in a hurry. I finish the binding and get up to the counter. Sorry about the wait, what can I do for you? Can I see your resume paper selection? Our resume papers were literally sitting six inches away from her on the counter, in a little bound book that said, Resume paper, printed in big, bold letters. I slide the book over in front of her and open it up. As she flips through it, she proceeds to complain about the color and texture of every paper before asking me the price. 15 cents per copy, plus 7 cents if you want to print on the second side. That's expensive, don't you have any paper better for that price? Sorry, that's our full selection of resume papers. The only other options are plain white copy paper, Astro Brights, which are neon colored, or card stock. Are you going to need this double-sided or single-sided? I could see that she had in front of her her two-page resume, which usually printed single-sided. Which one is cheaper? Double-sided will be cheaper, but for resumes our customers usually prefer single-sided. Just give me 50 copies double-sided on the sandstone. I confirm her selection and head back to the copier to complete her order. I print out a proof. As a matter of quality assurance, I give it a once-over and confirm we're not getting any fuser marks, random spots, streaks, etc. I notice that her job title on her most recent job was something like... Copy... Weiter. I assumed she meant copywriter and confirmed as much by reading a bit of the description. Ma'am, I noticed your previous job title is... I'd appreciate it if you didn't snoop in my personal information. I apologize, I just noticed a type. Please just print my order. Malicious compliance kicking in. Okay. I printed the entire stack of 50 resumes and was squaring them up when I noticed Lorum Ispum Dollar Sit Amet in the last paragraph on the page. At this point, I had to tell her. Right? As I'm walking over to the counter to show her the missed filler text, she yells, Will you please not crimp the pages? I need to hand those out. So I make it to the counter, gently placing her copies in a bag, and rang her out. She did come back later to complain, but my manager assured her that we don't make it a practice to proofread customers' documents. That's their responsibility. 5. Gear yourself up as this is a long one. All you punctuation and spelling experts take the day off, as this is a story about a delivery driver, myself. Not a job that requires an ology in the mechanics of the English language. At the start of COVID in the UK, where all good stories start, I had myself an easy job working in a casino. Once lockdown started, we were all put on furlough for six months. I finally had all the free time that I said I needed to do all the things I've never had time to do. Like many people, having time is not the same as having motivation. And all I did in that six months was become very good at Call of Duty, drinking beer and putting on weight. After the first lockdown was lifted, we returned to work with many changes, and most of them just made the job a drudge and I started to hate it. When we were told that we would be going into lockdown again, I had to make a choice for my own sanity and my waistline, that I would leave this job and do something so I could be working. Sounds crazy now that I would choose work over free money for doing nothing, but that is what I did. There is also a story in this, but that's for another time. The new job. I looked on Facebook, it was locked down and it was easy. As said previously, it lacks motivation. I found recurring adverts for work with one of the world's largest online shops. We'll call them amazing. Not amazing and this was in the last mile part of the service as a delivery associate, delivery driver. The money was good, and you would be driving a branded van, all fuel paid, easy job on the face of it. In September, I contact them, and get called in to do a tox test. While I'm here, I get the info on the situation. I'm not actually working for Amazing, not Amazing, but I'm working for a delivery service partner, DSP. In fact, I'm not really working for them, as I'm a self-employed contractor. In essence, I was going to be paid £100 a day, 
If we got good delivery numbers for a week, we would get a bonus of three levels on all the days I worked. It's a standard thing with Amazing, not Amazing. And the branded vans. Having heard some horror stories of how the non-branded drivers are treated and fleeced by the DSP that they work for, Amazing Not Amazing knows that it's going on and don't care. This seemed a good deal. No in-van training was given due to COVID. But I've driven big vans and trucks and all sorts, so not a problem for me. Scary to think, though. They give no training and let people loose on the roads in these vans, and it's not changed much without the COVID restrictions. Amazing Not Amazing seem not to worry about this. The work takes a bit of getting used to, and it's hard work to start with, and in all weather conditions. The routes are all pre-caged, so you collect your parcels, and you get a device that tells you where to go. Route times are 8 hours, and the little Amazing Not Amazing computer programs the route. You have 1 hour extra for retries. When you first start out, even after 9 hours you'll be behind, and some poor soul who finished their route early will come and rescue you. More on this later. If you go over the 9 hour mark, your DSP gets a fine from Amazing Not Amazing. By the time December rolls around, the DSP that I'm working for has taken on loads of extra drivers and more branded vans. He even taken on 20 non-branded vans with promises from Amazing Not Amazing for continued work over the festival season and into the next year. Not even half the non-branded vans got used. I have become very efficient at looking at my route in the morning and changing it around. My 8-hour route can be completed in 4 to 5 hours. And in December, we started work at 6 a.m., so I was the one doing the rescues, or if everyone was up to date, I would be home by midday. It was really that easy, although them bonuses never seemed to kick in. Amazing Not Amazing had never had a problem with it, and I was working weekends when they had a real problem getting people to work them days, and many people dropping shifts. Roll in January, and suddenly Amazing Not Amazing tells my DP, We can't give you all that work we promised, so you're going to have to let a load of your drivers go. End of January, I get home, and my partner throws a pregnancy test at me and said, I'm not getting fat, I'm pregnant. Then bursts into tears. Turns out she was five months pregnant, neither of us are young, and she just thought it was menopause. Not the ideal time with work laying off drivers, but... I had laid good groundwork to being a good driver, never sick, always working weekends and helping out when needed, even picking up dropped shifts. I had to drop a shift a week or so, so the DSP could keep as many drivers as possible, just in case Amazing Not Amazing actually gave them more work. I was fine with that, and the four-day week means more time with baby mama watching her belly grow and the baby due in May. By the end of April, I am doing five days a week. And now COVID restrictions are loosening up a bit more, and the DSP I work for are training new drivers and getting them to go out a couple of times with experienced drivers to show them the ropes. And I get to be doing that a lot. It's a great skive, as it's half routes, and even with someone that's slow, it's four hours max. I tell them I'm going to be off for a bit in mid-May, and I'll let them know when I'm coming back. I don't get holiday pay or paternity leave, but my bank balance is okay. Damn, I'm about to be a dad. I take off till early July. It's great being home with the baby and her mum. She's awesome. Her mum is awesome. And life is good. But I've made the decision I need to be doing something else as this job has very limited prospects. I start on a course that'll take about a year and I can do it around working for Amazing Not Amazing. I go back to work and it kind of runs the same as a year before. But I get to train new drivers, and again, as Christmas comes, the DSP takes on loads of new drivers and the load more vans as amazing, not amazing, has promised them more work even after the Christmas peak. I shit you not, they are ten non-branded vans and I only ever saw two go out on routes. I say nothing and just crack on, head down, only working four days, two of which are weekends, as I need to study and help out with the baby. Come January and all that work they'd promised DSP was no place to be seen and it was time to get rid of excess drivers. Again, I'm in a good position as I complete my routes and help when needed. Also work Saturday and Sunday. I need a minimum of four days a week to cover my lavish lifestyle 
pay bills, support my family. Already spoke with the boss and told him this and was assured that because of my rank as a top five driver, it was of little importance to me until this, in the DSP I'd be fine. Here comes the malicious compliance. Sorry it took so long. Come February, I check the rota and I've only got three days while other people get five days. And they don't do weekends, yet I do. Not one to be messed around, I contact the boss and explain my frustration at the lack of work and tell them that going forward I won't be working weekends unless I get four shifts. The following week, we were told that if you want more than three shifts, then you need to work at least one weekend shift. Following week, I'm on three shifts again, including Sunday and Saturday. The week runs Sunday to Saturday. I go in on Sunday, speak to the boss, and he says nothing he can do about it now. I tell him you best get someone to cover that Saturday then, as I won't be doing it. Come Saturday, my phone gets lit up, and I just ignore it. I put in my request for the next week, Monday to Wednesday, no weekends, and three days only. Had a nice late sleep on Sunday, removed my DSP boss's number from my favorites, so it couldn't get past my silent mode on my phone, and sure enough, I had about ten missed calls and a few messages asking me to cover dropped routes. On Monday, I was back in, did my route, took about five hours, and the rest of that week went like that. Come the weekend, I'd get missed calls and messages as they were desperate for weekend drivers. Not much they could do, as I was only doing three days a week now and not working weekends. Come March, and all of a sudden, amazing, not amazing, tell the DSP that your drivers are finishing their routes too quick. Tell them to slow down. I get told this, and I'm like, hold on. We get paid the same money to do the same job, but you want us to do it slower? By this time, I've had enough, and I'm ready to quit anyway, and I've got myself something else lined up that I'd been working on. So I went on out that day and bashed my route out in just over three and a half hours. Admittedly, my boss was not happy, but I no longer had any respect for him, so it didn't bother me. Next day, I'm 30 drops ahead and get the message that I need to slow down, or I won't be on the rota next week. So I Zoom call my dad, and we chat for an hour. I actually take a lunch break, the first one I'd ever had as a delivery driver. Managed to push it to seven hours and I still got berated in the team WhatsApp group. So I thought, sod this. I came in the next day with some textbooks and put my device in airplane mode. When I got 30 ahead, I stopped. Did some reading, got myself 30 behind chilled. Even had a nap one time after the baby had a bad night. I did this for a few weeks. My days were longer, but I was getting my study done and my course was nearly done. I had set up my interview with the company that would give me a job, and obviously, I did it over a Zoom call from the back of my delivery van. I overrun my route that day by 15 minutes, which is a big no-no, but hey, I got the job, so I wasn't too bothered. I needed to continue working for four more weeks, but I was going to do it at a snail's pace. A snail with a lip. I maxed out my drive time every day. They stopped sending people to rescue me as I'd just slow down even more. I went from top rank to lowest and still no sign caring about it. I jacked it in a week early, as I no longer had the will or need to do it. I will say this about that job. I met some great people and made some good friends. I experienced people from other countries and cultures, and we had a laugh when it was good. But the staff turnover is unbelievable. And how that company treats people like expendable objects has really darkened my view of them. Now, I'm sorry if I bored you with this, but it amused me at the time, and I thought I'd share. Hey everybody, Hello Freezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 169. Mm, oh my heavens, yes please. Right, let's see, um, let's move along, and uh, if you can have before you go, if you could please... Uh, Hook that like button there for me so the video will give you a little bit of a thumbs up and then everyone will know you like the video uh, because YouTube YouTube needs thumbs up. They like thumbs up. It helps them recommend the video to other people. Then they watch it. I get more views. Then they recommend the videos to other people. And somewhere in that equation that leads to sushi and cookies. I don't know how, but that's what happens. Okay, right now, before we go on, we actually have a little birthday shout-out to do today. 
And today's birthday shout out goes to doo, 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 Chihuahua Lady. Oh, hello, Chihuahua Lady. Uh, she is 48 today. Just double check. Yep, September 5th. And this was sent in by W. Missy Q. Or, or W. Missy Q? W. Missy Q. I want to say We Missy, but that's probably wrong. Anyway, uh, do, 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 I hope you're having a great birthday today. And uh, we're, we're still celebrating our birthdays for a month long. Because these are dark times. And we may as well make all the brightness we can. So whatever you enjoy doing best, make sure you do it. And if you're busy, because we can get busy, please take a little time for yourself, yeah? That's important to do so. You deserve it. Right, now before we go, I'm going to sing happy birthday. And then we'll have a question of the day. Don't know where it is yet, but I'll think of one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Chihuahua lady. Happy birthday to you. All righty, let's see. Now we'll move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is, which of the two would you rather have? A device that teleports you anywhere you want whenever you've got to go, thereby eliminating the need for cars? Or a device in your home that produces any kind of footing or clothing or household object you might require simply by you telling it what you need, thereby getting rid of cookers and probably washing machines as well. Just put their clothes back into the thing. Let them break it down and remake another one. I personally would go for the, well, it's uh, technically a replicator, but what I had in mind is more like uh, nanobots, so it builds atom by atom. Um... A bit like a maker from Transmetropolitan, but same idea, replicator, because that would be much more useful to me since I don't often go anywhere. Uh, plus, you know, if I could transport everywhere, I probably wouldn't do a lot of walking, and that would be bad overall. But yes, making things on demand. Yes, please. I'm certain we'll have them, just not in my lifetime. But I'm curious to hear what you folks think, so please let me know in a comment below. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.